Welcome to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. Can objects be haunted? Can you rely on information you get from a ghost box? Are certain guests being bumped off once they appear on this show? Greetings and welcome to the 581st broadcast of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. I am Ben, and those wide-ranging questions came from my co-host and partner in the paranormal, my dad. And this evening, we bring you the first of two open-line shows to answer your questions about anything paranormal from that ever-growing stack of emails, Facebook messages, and all sorts of other communications. So we welcome your calls this evening. The numbers are 800-449, that's 1240 from anywhere, uh, in the U.S. or Canada, or 401-766-1240, that is locally. Also, we will monitor emails, paul at behindtheparanormal.com, for your emails. Okay, let's pick up where we left off at the last Open Line show, and I believe that was with Nancy from McKeesport, Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah, I would have remembered a name like that. Uh, okay, so... Well, McKeesport or Nancy? Uh, both. Oh. So Nancy writes to us, uh, Paul, I saw you on the Travel Channel about um, objects being haunted. I think my son has a haunted basketball. It belonged to his half-brother that died, and it it does not try to hurt him. It just keeps moving by itself, and it never stays uh, where he puts it. Uh, I saw it myself rolling across the floor by itself. Uh, What do we do? I do not feel right getting rid of it. (laughs) All right. Well, that's an interesting one. Boy, that Travel Channel show must be growing whisker, whiskers by now. We made that no two. Was it the Curses of New England? Curses of New England. That's okay. right. Yeah. yeah, That's what I thought. Well, immortality through reruns. I suppose, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, haunted objects. Yeah, that uh, I remember the question was the only answer I gave the producer liked because she wanted uh, spooky, scary stuff from, you know, the 19th century, and I gave her the multiverse and quantum physics. But anyway... The uh, the whole idea of objects being haunted is quite interesting. We have several emails on that. I know we're not we probably won't get to some of those until next week. But how can an object be haunted? I'm thinking of a case that Ben is familiar with as well. Uh, began in 1998 uh, before his uh, he joined me, but it's we're still monitoring it. And the people in a house in Burrowville, Rhode Island, right in our listening area, moved. At least this is what they believe happened. They moved the table, and everything started to happen. And I hear that. I had. Um, I remember one time I was lecturing before your time as well, Ben, and um, a man and a woman came up to me. They were married. He was a doctor. She was a nurse. And they said, obviously very feet on the ground people, didn't believe in any of this, didn't even think about it. And they started to renovate their house, and all this stuff started to happen. I hear this all the time. So why, why is that? Well, as best I've ever been able to evaluate it, in, in cases like this, you have a, I suppose, what you might call a consciousness wave. And this, again, this gets into physics. Mm-hmm. But w- one of the things you have to forget is what you've learned, is what you think about yourself. Remember, we always say on this show, everything you know is wrong. Well, in this case, it's especially wrong because there really is no such thing as just us as islands, okay? Our consciousness, our memory, our imagination seems, and the physicists will, some physicists will back this up seem to stretch out across a vast wave, if you will, across many different worlds, and it's all kind of us. There's, there's a real unity there, and we don't stand isolated. So, so the same with objects. If there is a... Um, uh, well, all the peop- think of it as... An, uh, ben is telling me how uh, LP vinyl records are coming back, right? Yes, indeed they are. Think of a vinyl record like that, a flat kind of plane... a P-L-A-N-E there, and it's got... Suppose there are bumps in it. Grooves. No, no, but bumps in this case. Yes. I, I'm thinking of some models you see of the solar system. They're not accurate, but they, this is sort of, oh, it's accurate now. This, there's a, a gl- uh, the plane of, of the, uh, they're all uh, sort of in, in a big line. Okay, yeah. And, I, I see, I see uh, the you planets see. are like bumps in that. So think oh, of it as, well, okay. however you want to think of it, that, that's what I'm talking about. The, the bumps or the lumps in the thing are objects that you know, that you love, uh, there are many, especially as you get older, believe me, I have some experience with this because I'm old as dirt, but you, you've got uh, uh, furniture, objects of furniture, old pictures that mean a lot to you for the sentimental value. Those are all bumps in this plane of your consciousness wave, so to speak. When someone else comes and moves that, it disrupts the consciousness wave. So it's not that the object has a ghost in it or attached to it. It's that the object is attached to someone's consciousness. 
probably that of many people across many worlds. So again, you know, you got the tail wagging the dog if you think that the, there's a ghost attached to the table or to the to the house, that, you know, with the room where you're starting to renovate. Uh, th- there are possibilities there, but I think generally, uh, when you um, have this basketball that we're talking about in this question, uh, it's probably part of the consciousness wave of this person. Uh, now you say that there was a, I believe, a half brother who who passed or translated, as yes. you say. And uh, it's not that he's coming back to haunt the basketball; it's that the basketball is still part of his consciousness wave, because he he really. I mean, death it doesn't mean a thing. It really does. I know it's easy to say when you're not dead, but when you have uh, this experience of, of bodily death, it's like, as we always say, a leaf falling off a tree in the autumn. There are still you know, thousands or millions of other leaves because the tree is, is your life, not just the leaf. So the life that's in the tree continues uh, in many other leaves, and this is an analogy we use to describe this. So uh, the half-brother really hasn't, left the scene at all uh there are many scenes in which he never passed or whatever and that basketball is still part of his consciousness wave so it's kind of a funny way to look at it but again i don't think the object is haunted as much as it's part of someone's consciousness wave and uh i mean there's no reason to get rid of the basketball um i would um you know unless it starts you know jumping up and down and pounding you on the head or something i really wouldn't really worry about it that that much. I mean, it's the, this is part of nature. That this is the way things are organized. Uh, what we see is not what we get. We have certain points of view. Again, that we are isolated and that, that the paranormal is not normal. Well, it's very normal. These things happen all the time. This is just this just happens to be one of the instances that you noticed. Mm. So, uh, do you have anything to add to that? Ben? No. I mean, you pretty much just hit the nail on the head. I think the problem is we tend to overthink things. Yeah. And. It's it's a traumatizing experience to lose someone very close in your life, and it's it's it can be very uh, what's the word earth earth shattering? No, I'm, th- I'm trying so something that's that's well, it can make for a great deal of dishevelment. I, I guess yeah, I guess that works. Thinking, that, yeah. that 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 works then. That term works. So it's 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 a it's a spooky experience, but at the same time, you shouldn't overthink it. Just ex- yeah. see it for what it is. It's a basketball that's moving. And that's a funny thing in the paranormal, and it makes me. Un- it took me a long time to come to come to grips with this concept, but the more well, you ask anybody who has paranormal abilities, I suppose if you want to call them that, and they say the more the more they think about them, the less they can do them. All right, it, the more you analyze things in life, I suppose you're taking something that's beyond our. Um, ability to really understand, and ma- you're trying to make it into something you can understand, and you therefore weaken it. And I really, I don't know any better way to explain it, but, but uh, as one who grew up in a, with a scholarly background, I find it very uncomfortable uh, when it comes to advising people not to, th- not, not, it's not advice not to think; it's advice not to overthink, not to overanalyze. As Ben just yes, we're not, we're not saying just yeah. to, just close your eyes and just don't think about anything at all. No, but sometimes you can understand things better when when you don't analyze and limit from your own point of view. Right, you just let it feel it, let let it happen, and understanding will come in in uh, intellectually and in other ways too. Funny, I'm reading and this is off the topic, but I'm reading a book now, a sort of spiritual reading, I think. At the, but the, you've seen it down on our, the table in our library. Yes. And it's called The Experience of No Self by Bernadette Roberts. And it's, it's, it's great. It's from a Western point of view, but, it, but she sort of discovered what I'm saying and, uh, and beyond. And, uh, but in a way, I think losing the self, which is, I think, is one of the paradoxes of the multiverse, is if you want to find yourself, you lose yourself. Mm. Forget about You come to grips with yourself, accept yourself, and then forget yourself. That's how you discover yourself, and when you do, when you discover that, you discover that you're not just you. You're you're all of us, and it's not about you. It's about all of us, and that's a, a critical failing, I think, in modern societies that people think there's something to the island theory. And, and why is everybody so frustrated? Why are people committing suicide? Or why are people doing awful things to each other? Because they're trying to find something that isn't there which is a fulfilled self within the self. There is no such thing, and therefore they get all frustrated and crazy when they can't find it. 
That's true. I was actually just reading something that said that exact same thing. Yeah, well, this is not what Bernadette Roberts says, but I think, in a way, she's kind of concentrating on self, thinking she's losing. I don't know. I want to finish the book before I give make it a, a review. Make a, but, make uh, a full judgment. Yeah. So, I mean, we're really barking up the wrong forest here, I think, in many ways, when it comes to this. So, anyway, uh, I hope that answers the basketball question. Uh, who else do we have there? Uh, we have uh, Jin. Jean, Jean, Jean. Yes, that is uh, that is Jean. That's a very odd way of spelling it, but I'll accept it. So Jean from question mark uh, writes to us. I know this is a weird question, but I have heard you say that many people have died after being on your show. Oh, dear. Uh, do you think there is some connection? Because some people did not like uh, what they said. Uh, Annette Martin, uh, that was the police psychic from 2011. Stuart Wilde, the well-known British writer. Uh, yeah, we were the last interview we ever did. Yeah, that was back in 2013. Uh, uh, Jesse Marcel Jr. Uh, Sam Friedman had a heart attack after reading a couple chapters of our book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, he wrote. Well, all right. Well, Jesse Marcel, I believe uh, the, son, the son of the famous uh, Major Jesse Marcel. So I guess he retired as a colonel uh, who was of the Roswell case. Okay, very um, a prominent fellow in UFO history, um, but. He, that was his son, uh, Jesse Marcel Jr., and a uh, wonderful, wonderful person. We wish we'd had a chance to get to know him better. But uh, I believe this was the last interview he ever did was on this show. Uh, Stan Friedman, our very dear friend who has written the preface for our new book that is it should be published by the end of the year, Cosmic Journey, um, had a heart attack after he received the first few chapters. He assures us it wasn't because of what he read, but uh, nevertheless, he uh, fortunately is still with us. But in any case... Uh, you have to remember, you know, a lot of the we have, um, I don't know, ninety to one hundred people a year on this show, and especially uh, with CBS, uh, there was there were twice as many shows up until uh, CBS closed down that part of the network. But there were that's a lot of people, and many of them were are, are venerable older folks who have been involved in paranormal research, whether it be ghost research, UFOs, or any any of this stuff, for many many years. So naturally, you're going to have things happen to older people, and I, I just don't think it's sensible. I, I don't see any evidence that, that somebody didn't like what they say or said on the show, and then you know, men in black kidnapped them or bumped them off. I, you know, I, I think that that's a little too paranoid for me. So in any case, that's um, I think I don't know if that's the answer to the question, but I don't think there's anything specific to that. I, I'm sure that statistically you could look at other shows and see people who uh, maybe passed away right after being on the show or something like that. So I don't think that's a, that's a real problem. Okay, let's uh, move on to uh, some of the other emails we have here. Uh, here's what. Oh, okay. We have an entire list of. I hope Ben gets back for that, but. Here's one uh, from uh, Rajiv in Mumbai, India. And it came in on Facebook, and it says, I direct direct this especially to Paul. Nice short question. Are you afraid to die? Okay. I can answer absolutely without reservation, no. I don't even believe the darn thing exists. I don't believe there is any such thing as death. Now, that's easy for me to say, because as far as I know, I'm in relatively good health, and uh, I should be kicking around ON1240 here for uh, a number of years to come, I think, um, or at least one or two. So th- this is um, an easy, perhaps a naive way to answer. But again, I don't believe in death. I don't think Ben does either. Sure, you go to funerals, you go to cemeteries, but I mean, it's... It, it, it's the leaf off the tree again. And, and this keeps coming up, and we keep using that analogy because we think it works. You are the whole tree, not just one leaf. And in many, many worlds, you're, you're, it's you, it's the content of your subconscious here, there you have a conscious life, and what you're doing here is part of the subconscious. I really think that's how it works. And uh, you can't die. It's not possible. Probably the only thing that's not possible in the multiverse is death. So no, I'm not afraid. As a matter of fact, at the risk of gross misunderstanding and simplification, I look forward to it. I think we're experiencing it all the time in all sorts of different worlds. I think it's the root experience of our existence. Why, you might ask. Why the death experience at all? Why, is it, why would it be necessary? Why would God, whatever he, she, it, or they may be, build that into our experience of this super person that each of us is across this, the many worlds. 
Well, I often would sit in class with the dear nuns many years ago, or even in the seminary, and listen to descriptions of uh, eternal salvation or heaven or whatever you want to call it. And I said, well, this is all very nice, but I can't think of anything more boring. I mean, the sa sameness is boring. We have to keep changing, growing, or at least changing, hopefully for the better, in order not to die in any real sense. I think that, that the uh, descriptions, I think, of, of, of the sort of unchanging heaven, glory, whatever you want to call it, and I hope I'm not offending anyone here, but I think, it, I think it's boring. I think it would be death, real death. So as a result, I think that, that well, we, we've gotten into this in other shows, but heaven or whatever, uh, uh, any sort of salvation, is, is constant change, constant growth in a good sense, in an orderly sense, yes. So um, I, I, I think that the, bodily, the experience of bodily death is part of that change, part of that growth. So bodily death really is our ticket to survival. So, no, I'm not afraid to die. Easy question. All right. Ben, is there anything else on that page? Oh, oh yes, there is yeah, quite a bit so on many, this page. So many yes, okay. so Tara from Rentham, Massachusetts writes to us, uh, I heard you say you got in trouble in the seminary for doing paranormal research. I don't understand why. Uh, you would think that they would be interested in any insight on the spiritual world. Uh, did you get in trouble in the military for doing paranormal research? I mean, that uh, now you run into the military during cases, and I wonder if they were keeping an eye on you since you used to be in it. <laughs> Interesting set of questions from someone in our local listening area. Well, as far as the seminary was concerned, they, don't, they didn't really look at it that way. Uh, paranormal research into the spiritual realm was not really something they were looking for. You have to remember that in established, organized religions, they, a lot of them think they pretty much have most of the answers already, and that revelation has kind of stopped. You know, um, I, I, if, I believe that most of the Muslims believe that revelation stopped with the Prophet Muhammad. You know, there's no, nothing else coming after that. Uh, effectively, many Christians believe the same thing that uh, ev the revelation stopped with the Bible, and that's everything. And so they don't want to hear anything else. Uh, many Christians, not necessarily the Roman Catholics, uh, believe that, and, but many do, I've had them tell me this, prominent priests, that all paranormal events are the, uh, the product of demonic activity, you know, servants of Satan doing this to fool you. And sure, there are plenty of parasitical entities out there. I don't, I don't think they have the same theology, but they, they fill the bill. But there's also a lot of other things going on. There are a lot of other things going on that, that don't really fit uh, the, that particular point of view either, uh, that it would be explainable in one way. I think that, of course, that's a very easy way, uh, saying that everything is demonic, to dismiss it. It's a very easy way to think you have explained it. And it's very good job security for the clergy. All right? uh, on the other hand, there is a certain amount of wisdom in being very cautious. There's a lot of wisdom in being very cautious about the paranormal, about the revelations you think you may be receiving from it, because you don't know where it's coming from. You really can't be sure. I, I cringe. To this day, you have lots of people out there who say, well, this is definitely this loved one coming back and telling me this, or it's definitely the enlightened masters. And in the UFO bunch, it's the same thing. Uh, this this alien told me this and uh, and that sort of thing. You don't know who or what that is. You don't know if it's coming from you somewhere deep inside yourself. You don't know anything about that message or anything else. Why are there so many different kinds of messages that are received from these so-called masters and stuff? You know, Ben, that's always struck me. Mm. You know, so uh, I just think it really cannot be trusted. So. Uh, that's, there is a reason why the church authorities, in my case, were very uh, nervous about what it was. Although I was not receiving messages, I wasn't telling them anything about that. I was simply investigating. Much of that, too, was because I, I was considered too young, too vulnerable, and uh, they thought that I should have my nose in my books, which I probably should have, and uh, was, should not be paying attention to this. However, I felt a real calling toward it. So maybe the church and I both had a lucky escape because I was uh, dismissed uh, before ordination, and uh, that was nice and simple. 
Now, as far as the military was concerned, uh, no, I did not get in trouble in the Coast Guard for investigating the paranormal. Uh, as long as you don't do it, you know, as long as you did it on your own time, uh, there probably wasn't too much of a problem with you doing anything, having any kind of uh, pursuit that, as long as it was legal. So that was not too much of a problem. However, uh, I, I, was, I received a certain amount of cooperation from uh, the, uh, the senior officers on my ship because they, they, I was allowed to take cameras ashore, uh, in one case at least in Puerto Rico, for photographing uh, a case that was going on. Was that the, the, the ferry? That was the one with the, the ferry. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And there were one or two other things that uh, I was able to do. But they, they sort of thought it was cool in a way. But I didn't, anyway, it was, I didn't have any problem in the military. And the last part of the question had to do with uh, do you think that um, I, I, I'm being watched or something because of my... Now, I did have a security clearance, you know, n- n- not, a, not a high one, but I did have one, mm. you know, to the point where I, you know, if I was traveling to another country, I had to tell uh, my superiors and the intelligence people that I, that I was leaving the country. But um, uh, I, I don't really see any... They wouldn't have given me the clearance if they didn't think, if they thought it was any kind of a security risk. And today... I mean, again, I don't think it was that high. I didn't know any fantastic secrets, I don't think, uh, that would uh, require any sort of surveillance. I mean, you know, 20, 30, and 40 years later, like, like now. So I, I don't think that's an issue. So, but thank you for the question. Very, very interesting. Cool. So moving on, this is, yeah, we have, we have time for this. It's a short, it's a short one. Uh, this is uh, Glenn writing to us from somewhere. Uh, he writes to us, uh, we are house hunting, and how can you tell a house is haunted before you buy it. Uh, what do you do if it turns out to be haunted? Uh, should I research the house's history? I just want to be careful. Now, I would say, uh, it, I don't really think the history of the house matters. Well, I mean, it kind of does, but only if it's some crazy traumatic event. I think that you should be researching uh, water tables, have a soil engineer there as well, um, and check out the current electric bill. See if it's a little, little too high, uh, if it's a little little higher than normal. Um, in, maybe if the, the owners of the house are there and it's not some sort of uh, real estate agent who's only been there for like a day uh, and ask them questions about if anything weird's going on, of course, then they'll probably be like, oh, we just want to sell the house. Uh, so we're probably just not going to tell you about that. But I, I think, is it in Rhode Island where the landlords are legally obligated to tell you if your house is haunted? Or is that, I can't remember. I should have that, that information at my fingertips because people sometimes ask. There are certain states where there are laws. Connecticut is one. Connecticut, that's right. Where you have to tell, well, some of the, they vary in the wording. You have to tell a prospective buyer whether someone has died in the house. I mean, this is New England. Of course people have died in the house. I mean, yeah, exactly. it's, unless it's brand new or, you know, 30, 40 years old. You know, a lot of the houses around here are one, two, and 300 years old, so naturally it's going to be. Yeah, that's true. So, uh, but, but just because somebody, that, but they don't, see, the, the, the state legislatures don't understand the paranormal either, okay? No. Because that may have nothing to do with it. Well, but I mean, they, it, would be, it would be smart for touristy purposes. Because people would be like, oh, wow, we're living in a haunted house, like, whatever. Haunted house, yeah. Uh, Haunted, haunted, sorry. Lost control of my English language. Right. (laughs) Well, yeah, I mean, that's often... I often wonder about ghosts reported in hotels and tourist spots, because, you know, that that attracts tourists, or it can. And these uh, these things tend to get embellished over the years. Like the Queen Mary... Uh, out there in California, the, the retired uh, cruise ship that supposedly has a couple thousand ghosts on it, and we've talked about that. But in any case, uh, to answer your, your question, I think that you um, should take Ben's advice. That's always very good. Uh, when you're buying a house anyway, you should check on what the utility bills are. Uh, and, but if very often the electric bill is extremely high for no apparent reason, uh, we find that uh, people will tell us they're, they're, they've been having paranormal issues. Because there, there are many reasons why it might be too high, but one is that uh, people might be having paranormal issues. And I mean, par- like un- unreasonably high, like where, where yeah. it, just, it, it, it just doesn't make sense. Or if it spikes for no reason yes. in June or something, you know, or, yeah. or, um, or, or I really, well, whatever, depending on what utilities and uh, appliances you have. But very often you'll find that uh, parasitical entities will feed on the electrical system when they can't get you. They feed on energy. That's what these so-called demons really are, we think. Uh, they're not um, 
servants of Satan. They're, they're just they're life forms that feed upon on energy. They multiversal. They seem to reach from world to world, and we've talked about that many times. So, uh, but I would uh, give some further steps uh, above and beyond what Ben said. And this is what I did when we bought our house. That's almost 20 years ago now. Now, when Socket, Rhode Island, where we live and uh, where we broadcast from, is a um, well-known UFO hotspot. I don't know if a lot of people around here realize that, but uh, the great Joe Ferrier, our dear friend who was on this station for over 50 years, uh, was a uh, 1960s UFO researcher, and, we, and we've, we've talked about that. There's a book with a chapter about him we'll mention at the end of the show. And uh, we, the, the hill where we live, which is called Woonsocket Hill, it's uh, half in North Smithfield, half in Woonsocket, is a rather strange place. It's, it's full of water, so it's a giant ground plane antenna. Also, it's a strange... Um, uh, electromagnetic fields around there. A lot of there, there are some legends that attach to it, and a lot of things have been seen, and that's this sort of business. So um, I went into our house, and I um, uh, specifically requested to spend some time there by myself, and uh, very quietly, and kind of felt a place out. And I, that's something I'd recommend too. So just uh, just be careful. Uh, the history may or may not be relevant because. Uh, paranormal events may be originating in what to us is the future. So the history may not have been in. You know, if somebody went in there and started w- with uh, machine guns and started mowing people down, then you've got a problem. But uh, anyway, I just say uh, to be careful in the ways we suggested. All right, let's take our break. You're listening to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno on WON 1240 in New England's beautiful Blackstone River Valley. We'll be right back. It's your business. The health of our economy, the strength of our businesses affects every individual, every family. I'm Frank Prosnitz. Each Thursday, we'll visit with leaders to discuss important business and economic issues. Join me Thursdays at 4 p.m. on WOON. It's your business because it is. Okay, well, we have, there are a number of charities that Ben and I have adopted here on Behind the Paranormal, and we'll talk about those toward the end of the show because we've got a lot of stuff to get to, and we'll just get right back into it. Uh, is that good? Okay. No, I have, I, have, I have one last on this page. Okay, uh, actually, I'd like... All right, um, let's hold that. I want to make sure... There, there's a line of questioning from a listener in Colorado who asked that her name not be used, and uh, I'd like to get make sure we get to those in the next half hour. So Okay, we... so let's do this real quickly then. Uh, or, well, not really quickly. It's probably going to take the whole half hour. So, uh, from unnamed listener, you said? Yeah. Okay, so uh, listener from Colorado writes to us, one you mentioned in the show and your book about parasitic spirits slash ghosts. However, I could not locate any information on what one uh, should do to get rid or to rid yourself slash home of these or how to protect yourself uh, from these energy-taking leeches. Uh, could you please tell me uh, what you advise people in this situation, or what advise people to do in this situation? Okay. It's relatively simple. We use what we call the Peter Pan method, or theory, all right, which is think happy thoughts. And that sounds silly, but these things are repelled by positive energy. Now, what are these things? Now, in folklore, as we've mentioned, people think of them as evil spirits, demons, it depends on the culture, but everybody knows about them around the world, they've been known through history, and uh, they are deep in some religions and cultures uh, that think of them as uh, negative entities in one form or another. Uh, But they're almost inevitably thought of as spirits, because we're here in this, what we consider the material world, and we feel something, we see something moving for, with no, without any physical means, we see uh, entities of some kind, transparent or whatever you want to call them, and aha, they must be spirits, non-material beings, because they don't fit into our material world or into our materialistic paradigm. We believe that is wrong. We believe that there may be parallel worlds with Uh, forms of life that may be like that, but we think that those worlds are in the minority. We think that most worlds, from what we've seen, uh, are more or less physical. So what these parasites are, in our opinion, and in in my experience with them, is that they are life forms, living beings, probably quite physical in their own ways, in their own worlds, and they have the ability to, uh, as in anything in nature, they adapt and they have the ability to reach between 
or across the boundaries of worlds because th- these worlds are not part of a closed system. They're part of an open system. And energy flows back and forth. Inhabitants sometimes flow back and forth, and that's why you see ghosts, pretty much. And so, th- same thing with these parasites. That, that's essentially what they are. They do seem to feed upon negative energy. Uh, I, I remember a case in Pennsylvania and, and several other cases where these things seem almost like a, kind of an octopus seem to be reaching into several different worlds at the same time to feed upon negative energy. Uh, this is in the King of Prussia, Pennsylvania in 2004. And there was a case in, in the, uh, the, the yard of this house. There was apparently some sort of a negative event such as a murder going on from whether it be our past, somebody else's past, our future, whatever. It was, it was feeding on that, the parasite. And then it was feeding uh, on the, the uh, annoyance and fear of two young girls who were sharing an apartment uh, that was part of the house, of which this was the backyard. And then there was a third level, a third world, where the, the girls thought these were ghosts, but the ghosts thought the girls were ghosts because they were living their own life in a parallel reality, and the parasite was feeding on the fear that was going on there. It was re- really quite a complicated situation. So what do you do? You bring in, as we say, positive energy, uh, you, you, uh, if you have a family, you didn't specify there, uh, if you have a family, you come together with them, you work out your differences, you bring in a positive atmosphere, you laugh, though not at each other. I'm always telling Ben and his brother that. Because mm. uh, you, you, laughter is, and humor is very positive, in the, used in the right way. It is indeed the best cure. Yes, laughter is the best medicine. <laughs> And uh, as, as I often say, there was a case in 1975 in Connecticut that I got rid of the worst poltergeist. It was worse than the Bridgeport one, the worst poltergeist I ever encountered by using a joke book because everybody got positive. Okay? So that, that's it. That's the whole thing. Love really is the key. Positive energy, uh, faith, laughter, anything strong that brings people together rather than... Div- See, because that's what these parasites seem to do. They seem to want to divide people because that makes people weaker. When we're together, we're strong. So that's it. That's the answer to the question. Cool. So moving on, because there are two, three more parts to this. So um, uh, the writer also writes, I recently came to know you uh, through listening to archive shows on Coast to Coast AM. I hope you post photos soon in your photo gallery, as I was disappointed. Yeah, sorry about that. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. We have a photo gallery with no photos in it on the New England Ghosts uh, website. So. Cool. Okay, uh, it continues on. I wanted to comment on the farmhouse photos you posted. In the first one, which looks like a uh, shot from the dining room into the kitchen, I see the head of what people call a gray, a- or gray aliens peeking out from the uh, right side of the photo. In the bedroom where you see a hand is uh, reaching around the corner of a bed, I wonder if that is a child as I see a teddy bear at the end of the arm, uh, even though I cannot see fingers. Okay. Now, let, let me refer anyone who has access to the Internet to these photos. Uh, if you go to NewEnglandGhosts.com, there is a link on the left for cases, and the case you want is Connecticut's Skinwalker Ranch. Okay, we've done whole shows on this. We did one a few weeks ago uh, with Bill Hall, the author, who is, uh, is is has written a book about this case. It's coming out in August, and uh, we'll be talking about that. But th- that's what what that's the case you want to look at if you want to see these photos. The uh, the, the quintessential photo from the case, we believe, was one that we believe showed two overlapping worlds. You have to you have to know this farmhouse because this is common there. There seems to be a um, Sort of a, of a series of world intersects that seem to be stuck in this uh, at this property, and all sorts of interesting things are reported, including ghosts, UFOs, uh, all sorts of seemingly unrelated phenomena. So, so that, that's that's the background of this. So, this particular photo that uh, our uh, listener is referring to has a picture of what appears to be two different versions of the same room. Uh, now, this was taken by the homeowner in '03. We have, it's been looked at every which way, and unless she took it through a glass, and we know her very well, as a matter of fact, she turned out to be a distant relative uh, of ours, we don't, we have every reason to believe this photo is legitimate. And <clears throat> we did not see this so called gray alien that our listener was pointing out. No one had seen that in years. It, it appears in my book, Turning Home, God, Ghost, and Human Destiny, and nobody seemed to notice this. But when she pointed it out, we all looked at it again, and it seems, how could we have missed this? Now, this is going to sound extremely strange, even for this show, but there are things in photos that I've had over the years 
that come and go. There are things that were in photos, because I have notes on it, from, say, the 70s, and by the time the 80s had come, that it had uh, faded away, not because the, the print faded, it was good old Kodak paper and stuff, but because it just wasn't there anymore. These are things we refer to as extras, things that really shouldn't be there, as far as we know. Uh, things have, have appeared in photos that, from time to time, not, not commonly, but from time to time. So maybe this wasn't noticed because maybe it wasn't there before. I don't know, uh, odd as it may sound. But you can see uh, this head of almost like the, the, the classic gray alien kind of uh, being uh, right up by the refrigerator, and it does seem to be separate from the surface of the refrigerator. And we asked all sorts of questions about what might have been, uh, you know, magnets or whatever that might have been on looking like eyes. And it, it seems very clear that there's something interesting and extra in the photo. Whether it's a gray alien, I don't know. But in this case, this is where it led us. It led us from the ghost thing and some minor poltergeist stuff to what if, UFO sightings all over the community, reports of, of gray aliens in people's bedrooms and things of this kind, and so now we're wondering. So that is what we're referring to. And uh, when this listener wrote in about this, that got us all going. And Mark D'Antonio, a very dear friend of ours, who is uh, the Mutual UFO Network's uh, chief of photo and video analysis, has been on the show many times. Uh, he's co-hosted the show. He um, has not gotten back to us on that photo, which means he's kind of, if I know Mark, that means he's still kind of working on it, and that means there might be something mm, to it. That's true. So I don't know. Maybe, I, maybe I'm not getting that right. But, uh, so we will let you know on that. So that's the photo she's referring to. So thank you very much, um, listener in Colorado, for your, your insight on that, because you might have pointed out something all of us missed. Is there any part, other part to that question? Yes. Uh, it's a speculation about uh, aliens or hybrids going after DNA. Yes, uh, this has become a common theme for some years now in UFO research. Uh, I know that uh, in the Rendlesham Forest case, we've discussed uh, ad infinitum on this show. There are opinions from the witnesses who are all there on the same nights that um, th this was Soviet, it was an alien craft, or it was a craft from the future. Uh, our good friend Jim Penniston uh, who, uh, with uh, John Burroughs and uh, Nick Pope, uh, the well-known UFO fellow uh, from the British Ministry of Defense, uh, actually walked into, up to the thing and put his hand on it while it was landed on the forest floor in Renison Forest. And he, he uh, was later hypnotized and, and said that he had uh, felt that they were us, and he believes these were time travelers. Okay? And one of the reasons for, and this is not the first opinion, that these might be not necessarily aliens, but some people from our, maybe our remote, remote descendants, whose DNA has deteriorated to the point where they need to uh, sort of refresh their supply. Hence, the idea that uh, these abductions are taking place. Now, th I'm not saying I believe this, but this is all uh, speculated upon by sometimes, uh, you know, very, very intelligent people whom we respect, that the DNA uh, taken from our uh, sources here at, in our time, place, whatever, is used by them to um, uh, re sort of revivify their own uh, gene pool, okay? I suppose there's a certain amount of biological sense to that, if that's what's going on. The hybrid thing seems to be another level to that, and there are people who believe that when they are abducted, they uh, were used for breeding purposes with an, uh, someone who is alien, and the resulting child uh, was a hybrid that supposedly will do something, including revivifying their their gene pool. So, I mean, I suppose that you know that's all biologically possible, except that if you have an alien race, to me, as Ben often points out, they'd be alien. You wouldn't be able to interbreed with them. Yeah, that just doesn't make sense. Unless they had fantastic technology for gene splitting. All right, which may be possible, but if these are our descendants. They wouldn't be so alien. They might look different. I mean, what would we look, what would we look like in uh, what did human beings or their, our ancestors look like a million years ago or two million years? They were ago? much shorter than we were. They looked a lot different. Yeah. You know, if they really were our ancestors, which I see no reason to doubt that they were. So, what would we look like in two million years? Maybe we'd be little little gray guys with big heads and funny eyes. I don't yeah, know. but even then, the DNA would be so different that they couldn't really do much with it. I don't know. Would it? 
I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not a genius. So that's not, not your field or mine. No, my. not at all. <laughs> yeah. I have no idea. But that's what we're talking about here. So I guess the, uh, the best answer here, listener in Colorado, is I don't know. Yeah. Neither does Ben, I suppose. You know, But these are all things that are being considered. So uh, what do we have next? Uh, we have a question from Marie writing to us. Uh, I hear people say that uh, all religions are good, but you say there are negative ones. Do you know if any religions that attract negative forces uh, that, that attract negative forces and don't repel them? Is there any way to make the best of being in a negative religion? Well, that's an interesting set of questions. The thing is that uh, yeah, I mean, people who who say that all religions are positive uh, don't know their comparative religion or their theology. You know, there are plenty of religions that, uh, in, especially in, in the human past, that called for human sacrifice. Is that good? Uh, I've, I've heard people justifying that, uh, especially in, in the, the Celtic lands, by saying that, well, th- these were condemned criminals anyway, and maybe they were um, uh, given a chance to die honorably. Well, man, you could look at th- it that way, but there are plenty of negative religions. Well, I uh, think there's a difference between relativism and pluralism. There's a very big difference yeah. between that. I've I've had I've had lively lively debates with many people where they say, well, I mean, everything's relative, and then it's like, well, I mean, there has to be good and evil. Like that, you you can't just say, well, I mean, it might work for some people. I mean, what about the people that would sacrifice to the god Baal and throw infants into fiery pits because yeah. they thought they were doing the right thing? Well, who told them to do that? That's what I want to want. And I have theories about that, and it has to do with our little parasite friend. Exactly. Yeah. But in the meantime, we have a caller. So why don't we uh, take our call, and we'll get back to our question in a bit. Hello, welcome to Behind the Paranormal. Hello, I hate to interrupt you. It's very interesting. <laughs> oh, the Bill from Franklin, right? Yeah. Oh, very good. Um, you, you were talking about, about objects earlier. Uh, my, my brother, my younger brother who passed away in 76, uh, my, my mother had his, his uh, watch, and, and when he died, his watch stopped, and it never, never ran again. <laughs> I've heard of that. Yeah, <laughs> oh, it's all, I think it's all part of that consciousness wave. I mean, and nothing stands by itself. You know, the Native Americans would always say, and they still tell you that everything has a spirit yeah. in it. You know, and I think that's just another way of saying that that nothing is separate from anything else. And um, my one, one of my new, new friends, uh, uh, Julia, who's a, who's a minister, I I I, uh, I liked her instantly, and she said, so, "Oh, we were probably uh, connected in in a." In a in a past life, and we're meeting each other again. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I might, I might rephrase that and say you're connected in a parallel life, and you're connected anyway. And there you go. So maybe it's six and one half dozen of the. It was like other. an instant, in, instant liking, you know, you know, you know, to her. Nothing wrong with that. And and we both both like photography, and oh, I get along with her so well. Very good. Well, glad to hear that, Bill. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks for your insights. Okay. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye. All right, so again, uh, I think that we've, we're dealing with um, uh, some very, very strange religions out there at times. Uh, obviously, you can point to certain religions now that are going around, uh, uh, you know, uh, killing people. I mean, the, 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 the Muslims will point to the Christians and say, well, you did the same thing during the Crusades, and the, and the Christians will point to the Muslims, or anybody will point to the Muslims today and say, you're doing the thing right now. And uh, I don't know, it's just, uh, it, it's... Human nature, I think that's the problem very often. We, um, we tend to make excuses, and uh, God will probably be the first to tell you that he, she, or them has been the best excuse, one of the best excuses people have used to justify their own cruelty and their own immaturity and, and, and all this business. So uh, there's plenty of guilt to go around, and not all religions are good. I would say. There are many forms of religions that are considered good that aren't necessarily good. Uh, I have experienced uh, many um, within uh, th- there, there are aspects of, of Christianity and Hinduism, particularly that I'm thinking that can be very negative, and, uh, but mostly very positive, but, but sometimes very negative. Um, so it, you have to you have to judge. We say, oh, don't judge. Well, you have to judge, or you're a fool, especially if you're a parent, you know. And you have to judge it n- not not by saying, oh, I'm better than you, but by saying, hmm, this might not be so great, All right? So. Um, Oh, we have another caller. Okay, we're gonna, we'll take a little break from our discussions here and uh, welcome. Uh, hi, how, how are you this evening? I'm doing very well. Yeah, welcome to the show. Is this, is this Tom? 
Yes, this is he. Oh, Tom Spidleri. Okay, we're going to talk about the New England Parafest. So, yes, Tom, well, that's yeah. coming up on the 18th, and uh, why yes, don't you tell us is. about it? Well, this year we, we're very excited this year. We're at the Ashworth by the Sea Hotel at Hampton Beach. Nice area. So, we're gonna, so if you guys have been stuck at home all winter because of this beautiful winter we've had. That's every single person snow. listening unless they're in Florida. And all that's even better. So they can come up this way. And join us April 17th and 18th. It's actually a day-night event. But you'll be there on the 18th. We have, um, we have. let's see, we have a local legend, um, Roxy Zawick is going to be there. Uh, Willie Hassel, Lynn Nickerson is going to be there talking about paranormal. I I, I, I got word here that, um, that uh, Paul's coming, too. Coming to speak, uh, what will you be speaking on? Because I didn't actually get that. Oh, well, see, yeah, actually, we were talking about that on the way over here. We uh, we have all sorts of subjects. We, did, we didn't know whether to uh, repeat anything we used last year, because we thought a lot of the people at this conference might have been at the two UFO conferences we spoke at in New England last year about the connections right. between UFOs and ghosts. But um, we're working on it, but I, I guarantee it'll be new and interesting. All right. Um, we also have uh, EVP specialist Karen Mossy coming. If anyone's watched the movie White Noise, the I Love You EVP was her father. Hmm. And the, they actually, uh, I don't know how that works with between them because she uses it too. But they got special permission to use her EVP. Cool. Uh, so she'll be there speaking. And then we have international, nationally known, um, cryptozoologist Lauren Coleman coming. That's always uh And yeah, we're looking forward to that. Speak. I'm always, I, I, I've actually never heard Lauren speak. I'm really, even me putting this event on is very excited because I've followed Lauren Coleman ever since I was a little kid. Mm hmm. Very good. And I'm still watching him today. He was on the other night again on another show. Mm hmm. So wh where do people so he, find information? You can go to EssexCountyGhostProject.org and then click on the Parafest site and Tickets, uh, there is special tickets still available up until Wednesday afternoon. Then we're going to go through the one-day tickets. Okay. But up to Wednesday afternoon, you can get a ghost walk, a dinner, and then all day at the Parafest. That is the Super Saver. Mm -hmm. That is only on sale till Wednesday. Okay. And there is a link to that on both our w websites, NewEnglandGhosts.com and BehindTheParanormal.com. Just click on that and take you right to the, the um, uh, Essex County Ghost Project site and the Parafest site. Very good. Well, Tom, we'll, uh, we'll look forward to seeing you there. and we'll I look forward to seeing you again. You guys were great last year. I enjoyed it. I'm going to enjoy it again, and I know the public's going to enjoy it. And I thank you for helping us out. And one more thing. All the money raised for this Parafest is going to... The Hilldale Cemetery uh, Corporation yep. in Havel, Massachusetts, to, re to fix a cemetery that's got over a million dollars worth of damage in it. Wow, well, that's a that's a great cause. So, okay, Tom. Well, thanks for taking a dime. So we, I want to thank you again and have a great week, and we'll see you in a couple weeks. We'll see you there, Tom. Thanks very much, okay. everybody. New England Parish. No sounds great. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay, sounds terrific. So anyway, be careful what religion. I, and I'm thinking too, Ben. You know, in '84, when I was in, in uh, Haiti, and uh, I, it was, I was uh, befriended by a voodoo priest, who, uh, and it's very rare. I went to a voodoo ceremony, and I will never forget it. And there was very little positive that I saw. The Loa ceremony, people possessed, and all this it was, it was really one of the scariest things that ever happened to me. So, um, I think that's an issue uh, with that. So, in any case, uh, do we? And we have another question. I think. Um, huh? Oh no. That's sorry, I didn't cross. Oh, okay, it down. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, that's, yeah. that's done. Well, I know that uh, we're go uh, there'll be probably some more questions from our listener in Colorado next week because it'll be another open line show. Uh, I know that she asked uh, for the um, the nine different species, or someone did, of the parasites that we have kind of pinned down, and uh, I I uh, need to extract that from my files and bring it next week so we can discuss it in detail. So, uh, but thank you. Uh, Everyone has written in questions. They're good questions. And what, what do we got? We have time for one more. Oh yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is from Todd from Question Mark. Uh, he writes to us. I would love to see the psychological profile of some of the people you talk about. 
Uh, you seem like two of the saner voices in a crazy field. Do you look into uh, the psychological profiles of people that tell you their experiences? And do you find that the uh, same personality types have paranormal things happen to them? A uh, very interesting question, Todd. We obviously are not doctors. We don't have medical degrees, and we, we obviously don't have access to people's medical records. However, we have a lengthy questionnaire that we go through when we begin a case, and one of the sections has to do with the, the health of people in the household, and uh, one of those has to do with the mental health of people in the household, whether or not they've been uh, using drugs, uh, thing, things of that kind that might affect their perception. Uh, the history, the, the health history of the family, that sort of thing. So we do, we do get into that very specifically. And we warn people that, that there are going to be uh, personal and probing questions that will uh, be kept in, we, we keep the information confidential. But, uh, so we don't actually see their psychological profiles as such, but we do sort of uh, gain our own insight into that by, by questions that we ask. Of course, you, you never know. Uh, one of the things that I've, we find in the paranormal, there are actually two things. One is that the paranormal is never what it appears to be. And secondly, people never tell you everything. Sometimes that's because they don't, it, something doesn't occur to them that further explanation by us might bring to their minds. But very often, initially, we, don't, we aren't told everything. Uh, they might not uh, be able to say it, or they just won't say it. So there uh, we are. Yeah, I mean, you, you think in good faith they'd tell us. But that's it. But you, you never know. Uh, the whole question of psychology in this field is very interesting. As we've often said on the show, I worked as a seminary student and a graduate student in psychology many years ago, this was back in the 70s, in psychiatric hospitals, one in Connecticut, one in New York State, actually two in New York State if you really stretch it. And I would deal with people who were diagnosed schizophrenic. There were a lot of inpatients at the time. Uh, more than there are today, and I would I would get the impression that some of these people seem to be experiencing real worlds that they can see and we can't. Others were experiencing horrible worlds, and so uh, the the issue of whether this really is a mental illness or whether it's enhanced insight for better or for worse is is an open question. Uh, it maybe maybe in some cases. It might be just enhanced insight. Uh, it was difficult to say. So we're going to have to move on to our announcements because we have a lot of them. And uh, we'll continue next week with another open line show and, and to, the, to some questions we did not uh, get to tonight. So anyway, as you just heard, uh, Tom Spitaleri calling in from Essex County Ghost Project, uh, Ashworth-by-the-Sea in Hampton Beach, April 18th, uh, New Hampshire. The program begins at 8 a.m. And we're scheduled to speak from 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. And again, uh, not sure of our subject uh, uh, yet, but it could be the paranormal and human history or an updated version of our connections uh, program from last year. Other speakers will include uh, Lauren Coleman, world's leading cryptozoologist. More information, go to our website, behindtheparanormal.com. Look on the main page there for the link to the Parafest. Okie doke. So on October 10th, uh, we're scheduled to speak once again at the New England UFO Conference at City Hall in Lemonster, Massachusetts. Other speakers will include Richard Dolan, uh, Peter Robbins, and other UFO greats. Uh, you can watch for more information on that event and others coming up this year. That's also at our website. You can also find lots of other cool stuff there as well, including nearly 600 free podcasts of past shows from both ON 1240 and our four-and-a-half-year run on CBS Radio, along with uh, special shows and podcasts. And I'm afraid we have to include as part of our announcements tonight uh, something very sad. Uh, if any of you have read my book, Faces at the Window, uh, Bill Hall's book, The World's Most Haunted House, or heard one of our many on-air discussions about the Bridgeport poltergeist case of 1974, you'll probably remember the little girl, Marcy Gooden. Well, on February 10th, a Marcia Godin, 51 years old, died in Ohio, apparently from complications related to multiple sclerosis, terrible disease. It has been confirmed that this was little Marcy from the 1974 case. Bill was never able to find Marcy before he finished his excellent book on the case, and news of her death was uh, the first news he received about her. So please pray for Marcy. Apparently she had a very sad and lonely life after that terrible poltergeist experience, and it does make you wonder, maybe make you think a lot of follow-up is needed, uh, sometimes maybe for years with people who have these terrible experiences. Yeah, it's true. I mean, these things stick with you. Yeah. They're very traumatic. Terrible. 
Anyway, you can find my books on Amazon, including that one, on Amazon.com, Amazon Kindle, and the usual suspects, Barnes & Noble Nook. Uh, but if you buy them directly online at BehindTheParanormal.com, I'll be happy to sign them for you. And you'll help us keep all those podcasts free. Also on our website, you'll find direct links to several charities Ben and I have adopted, including USA Cares, Canadian Veterans Advocacy, Youth Mentoring Connection in Los Angeles, doing great things for at-risk youth. And there are two new books. Maybe I better... Well, anyway. No, you, no, feel right. free. we got time. There are two new books just released by Global Communications, Timothy Green Beckley's publishing company. That would be of interest to our listeners. One is The Bell Witch Project, which contains that story, and also a few contributions by yours truly on historical cases in New England. Um, and of special interest to folks here on ON 1240 in our listening area is another Beckley book, UFO Repeaters, with an entire chapter on our old friend Joe Ferrier, talk show host on this station for over 50 years. And both books are available at Amazon.com or use the links at the online bookstore at our show website, BehindTheParanormal.com. Okay, and uh, there we go. Next Monday, April 13th, here on ON 1240 and ONWorldwide.com, we will have another open line show. And on that note, we must wrap it up. I am Ben Eno, and he is Paul Eno. And, and thanks me. for joining us in our great cosmic journey, and we shall see you next time. Return to this radio frequency 167 hours from now for another edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno.